During the Second World War, RAF Fighter Command defended Britain from above, ever present in the skies to greet Luftwaffe intruders as they approached. But RAF Bomber Command would be responsible for taking the fight overseas to the enemy in an offensive capacity. Bomber Command would expend huge amounts of resources and lives in that task. The RAF bombing offensive against Nazi Germany was long, expensive and controversial. Its aim was to damage Germany's ability to fight. In 1939, Bomber Command targeted strictly military targets, warships and airfields. Throughout 1940 and 1941, the Royal Air Force carried out night bombing raids against German industrial targets, but it was very difficult to hit specific targets in the darkness. Then, in 1942, Bomber Command received a new aircraft and a new leader. The Avro Lancaster was brought into service and Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Harris was placed at the head of the command. It was decided that precision bombing was just too difficult and the British War Cabinet sanctioned area bombing, the targeting of entire cities in Germany in an attempt to weaken its ability to continue to fight. By 1944, the combined Allied bomber force was working effectively, reaching the height of its destruction in 1945. Its operations remain a controversial point in history. There's no doubt that over the course of the war, Bomber Command turned into a very powerful destructive fighting force on behalf of Britain. And in order to carry out the kind of work it did, a tremendous amount of work was needed behind the scenes to generate one very important commodity, intelligence. Members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force worked behind the scenes to collect, analyse, sort and disseminate intelligence that would be of vital use to Bomber Command in carrying out its mission. So what kind of information did Bomber Command need in order to be more successful in its missions? Well, all kinds of information. Topographical, for instance, it was useful to know what terrain looked like in an area where a raid was due to be carried out. Weather, it was useful for air crews to know what kind of weather they were going to be up against the night of a raid. Information on enemy defences, were they going to run into anti-aircraft fire? All kinds of information on what the enemy might be doing to prevent these kinds of raids. That was obviously useful to air crew. And then there was information on what targets they should hit in the first place. How could they hinder the German war effort by bombing a factory or an industrial area? You can see how this information would all be incredibly useful. During the course of the Second World War, over one million people, men and women, served with or supported Bomber Command. They came from around 60 different nations to make up the air crew, ground crew and support personnel. And some of this number were members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. There were four distinct stages to a Bomber Command operation. First, it had to be extensively planned WAF intelligence officers helped with this, collecting and compiling information on enemy defences such as anti-aircraft weaponry. They also liaised with Bletchley Park and kept statistical information on past raids, including types and numbers of aircraft involved, losses, bomb loads, routes taken to targets, timing and information from pilot interrogations. WAF would also provide the pilots with their flimsies pieces of rice paper with intelligence on that the men could eat if they were shot down and captured. All of this work would also be used in the second stage of planning a raid, the briefing of the air crews. During the third stage, the actual carrying out of the raid, WAF helped to guide pilots flying damaged and blacked out aircraft home. In the fourth stage, post-raid analysis, WAF would help to carry out assessments of how successful the raid had been and what its possible implications were on the German war effort. I'm here in Derbyshire in the Derwent Valley and this area is famous for the fact that the members of 617 Squadron in the Royal Air Force 
better known as the Dam Busters, carried out a number of practice raids in this area before executing their raid on the German dams in the industrial Ruhr Valley area. Those dams were the Morna, Eda and Zorpa dams, and it was determined that they were a strategically useful target for the RAF to take out. So Gibson and his Dam Busters crew practiced in this area. A very specific bomb was developed for this raid, and it was known as the Bouncing Bomb, developed by Barnes Wallace. And in order to drop it and carry out the kind of damage that they were hoping to, the Dam Busters had to fly at around 60 feet in altitude, about 230 miles per hour ground speed. Now that's very, very difficult. It's not a usual way of flying, and that meant that they had to carry out practice raids using dams such as this to kind of get to know what that was going to play out like when they did it for real. In order to do that, 617 Squadron needed a certain amount of work and help behind the scenes. And that's where the WAF come in. They needed information on what it was like to fly at that altitude and that speed in an area like this over water near a dam. There was lots of information and intelligence that they needed and it was up to the WAF to supply it. The WAF working with 617 Squadron to help them prepare for the Dam Busters raid provided Gibson and his team with all kinds of different information. A lot of that information had to do with what they might encounter when they got over to Germany. They needed information on the dams themselves and the area around them. It would help if they could know as much as they possibly could about the area before they were due to execute the raid and if they could get to know what it looked like. WAF used information from aerial photographs, models, all kinds of sources to help them know as much as they could before they set off. These women were literally locked inside their offices for several weeks before the raid took place. They were not allowed to leave the station. They had to have a special pass and a good reason for doing so. They were escorted to the bathroom so that they couldn't possibly give away anything pertaining to the raid, which was highly secret. And Gibson was notoriously obsessed with secrecy. The bouncing bomb developed by Barnes Wallace, which was actually more akin to a mine, was codenamed Upkeep, and it would spin backwards across the surface of the water before reaching the dam. It would then be driven by its residual spin down the dam's wall and would explode at its base. Lancaster bombers were specially modified to carry this unusual weapon. Guy Gibson even had his own WAF intelligence officer, and she's a fascinating character. She was one of the few people in the world that got to fly on a practice mission with the Dam Busters and experience what they were experiencing. You can just imagine the rumble of the planes overhead when the Dam Busters The success of Operation Chastise is debated. Of the 133 aircrew involved, 53 were killed and three were taken as prisoners of war. For the WAF who had worked so closely with them in the build-up to the raid, this must have been very difficult. It must have been unimaginably hard for WAF to wave off. The aircrew of Bomber Commander had become their friends, knowing full well that so many of them wouldn't come back. There were ideas in Fighter Command and Bomber Command, in the Air Ministry and in the Royal Air Force that women wouldn't be able to emotionally cope with the kind of work that they were going to have to do. But for the most part, it seems as if that simply wasn't true. And if anything, knowing that you were sending your friends off, perhaps to their death, actually made them all the more invested in their work, made them better at their work. One of the reasons the Air Ministry was worried about using WAF in intelligence work was their concern that the women would become hysterical or overcome with emotion. This was a particular concern where Bomber Command was concerned, with its very high rate of loss. During the Second World War, 51% of aircrew were killed on operations. 57,861 people gave their lives working in or supporting Bomber Command. The WAF, however, not only proved the Air Ministry wrong, they went above and beyond, using their emotional sensitivity and intuition to help traumatised, exhausted and injured airmen to cope when they returned from raids, while simultaneously continuing 
to collect vital intelligence that would enable the Allies to continue to weaken Germany's ability to continue the war. The WAF involved in intelligence work behind Bomber Command made a vital contribution to its operations. Working with traumatised friends and colleagues, dealing with a great deal of grief and loss, and working to keep the RAF capable of continuing to fight, the Bomber Command WAF are another group of women who have been hidden behind the few. For the first time, this is their story.